It's good to see that uh, so many of you have returned for uh, more. Uh, I thought I would have frightened you all away after yesterday. <laughs> Uh, today, I want to start a, uh, a new part of this uh, course and focus on eight of the main themes, theological themes, in the book of Exodus. But before I do, because, uh, um, are there any questions that carry over from yesterday? Uh, to just give you a chance to, you know, if stuff's occurred overnight and you've had some problems, uh, anything you... Yes, Chris? I did have, have one, one brief question about the altar. Yes. Um, again, the altar, uh, being told not to use any uh, human tools on it, yes. but only to use you know, stones and earth mm -hmm. from it. Um, I was wondering if, if there's kind of a running theme, the idea that the creation itself is holier than we are because of our sin. Because then you also see in Second Samuel, yes. The tabernacle is, is going to, I'm sorry, when the Ark of the Covenant is about to fall into yes. the mud, and Uzzah reaches out his hand to prevent that because he thinks it would be such a catastrophe, yes. and he's struck dead. Yes. So maybe the mud is holier than Uzzah. Yes. Not so much holier. Um, it has to do with the whole theology of creation. Okay. Um, that what God, everything God's created is common, and God created it as good. Okay, um, and uh, uh, sanctification is God takes the things of creation, uh, the good things of creation, uh, purifies them in order to sanctify them. So God's aim is not just, and this is, you can see this right at the beginning of Genesis, uh, with creation you get the seventh day. What's the significance of the seventh day? God not only blesses the seventh day, but he sanctifies the seventh day. So what's the ultimate goal of God in creating the whole physical world? Is twofold. Number one, to use the order of the physical world to bring blessing to human beings. But secondly, God's ultimate aim for the whole of creation is which is common and good, is to sanctify it. Okay. Right? But that's the way I would see it. Okay. Yes. And, and, and so in a sense, the, uh, so then by not allowing human tools to be used for the altar, is yes. that because we're unclean, the, current, the, the creation is common. Yes. I, would, so I don't see so much that it's a question of unclean. I see it as a question of uh, that it's natural. Okay. And it's God made, uh, and God's aim is to sanctify uh, the whole world. You know, what he does, if you like, the altar is a little bridgehead of heaven here on earth. It's holy, it's most holy, and from that bridgehead, God wants to reach out to the whole of his creation. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, he wants to sanctify the whole of his created order, not just human beings. Um, now, sometimes we limit God too much. He wants to sanctify, he wants to save, redeem, judge the whole world, redeem the whole world, uh, uh, sanctify human beings, but to also sanctify the whole of his creation. Um, and uh, that's, a, 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 I said yesterday that uh, a, one of the great um, recent emphases in theology is the importance of the body. And the sanctification of physical things. Yes? Yeah, I think that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Yes. When you're going through the gifts that God uh, delivers through the Ten Commandments, yes. I have taught in the first commandment that the gift is himself. Yes. And you said yesterday it was divine service. Yes. And I've usually said that that's the gift of the third commandment in terms of. God giving of Himself in the in the in the liturgy. In the yes. So maybe maybe there's there is no distinction because if He gives of Himself, yeah. He is the one who serves us. Right. So there's uh, uh, three things. No, the commandments. I'm going to come back to this, but just to uh, since you raise it in advance. Um, in Hebrew, the first commandment is. Quite literally, there, sh there will not be for you. 
there will not be for you. It's a statement of fact, which is also a command. There shall not be. So it's a fact and also a demand. There will not be for you any other gods. Al panai. Before my face. So what does God give us? His face. His panim. Now his face is his presence and his presence in the divine service. Now all the first three commandments have to do with the divine service. So uh, himself, yeah, that's not wrong, uh, but uh, in Hebrew, it's the panim that's given. Okay, so uh, the second thing then, in the second commandment, it's his shame. Or shem, his name. And the third commandment then is the uh, holy day. Uh, you shall uh, re remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So it's the Shabbat. Now, uh, Shabbat is not just uh, uh, day, but it's also rest. Remember the rest by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Um, so it is the Sabbath day, the rest day, rest, that whole configuration. Now, uh, I'll be coming to that uh, and seeing how we then, uh, how the church has come from there, the day to God's word, uh, in, uh, which we see in Luther's small catechism. Remember, uh, Luther says in the small catechism, what's, uh, uh, what's the explanation? We shall... Fear in our God that we do not despise, despise preaching, preaching as, as his word. Preaching his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn. So he focuses on the word. Why? Because the word is the means by which God gives us his rest, gives us set. So uh, okay, there's a kind of gradation here, God's presence. How do we have access to God's presence? Through his name. Uh, 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 all these have to do with liturgy, worship. Uh, then what do we receive when we have access to him through his name? We receive uh, his holy rest. The holy rest. And the holy rest comes to us through his word. Can you see the gradation here? It gives it very carefully... Uh, John, as you'd expect to do. the Hebrew here when they hear face, God's face, I mean, what do they think? That is exactly what I said. Uh, panim, the Lord make his face shine upon you. Now, um, where is God's panim? It's pretty difficult. Uh, a pagan person can say where the panim, the face of their God is. Where's the face of their God? The idol. The idol. Okay, you go and look at the face. Um, and the pagans used to come to the temple and they'd uh, look around and they'd have a question, which you'll find again and again in the Old Testament. They'd say, where is your God? The Romans, in fact, concluded that the Jews were crypto-atheists. Why? Because they had no idol. The Roman troops wanted to, you know, there's these Jews were defending this site. There must be some very, very precious, wonderful idol in the Holy of Holies. And they were disappointed because when they burst into the Holy of Holies, there was, what was there? No, nothing. And so they concluded that the Jews were in fact atheists. <laughs> atheists because they didn't have an idol. They had no pun in. No. Okay. Um, if you t think in terms of location, uh, uh, you have then a, 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 a reference again and again in connection with worship that something is done uh, Lif nay, uh, or lip nay, uh, in the presence of Yahweh. So lip nay, Yahweh, in the presence of the Lord. Okay, now, uh, uh, the presence of the Lord is located where? At 
the altar. That's a surprising thing. You'd expect it to be the Holy of Holies. It's empty throne. God's visibly there, and his punning is there. But uh, uh, people, Israel doesn't have access to God's punning, his face, in the Holy of Holies, but they have access to God's face at the altar. So to prostrate yourself before the presence of the Lord would be uh, uh, prostrating yourself where? At the altar. Or to bring your offering before the Lord means to bring it where? At the altar. altar. Now, without us knowing, that's exactly the message of the architecture there. What is it that represents, points to the presence of the Lord? The altar. Now, the whole architecture of all our churches, Lutheran churches, Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, now, the whole great Catholic tradition of worship is that the uh, presence of God is at the altar. And so if we kneel, or if we bow, or if we pray, if all those things, we're always directed at the altar, because the altar symbolizes the presence of God. And um, then the altar, and then particularly the presence of God is, uh, the presence of the Lord is in Holy Communion. Um, and uh, that's at the altar. Okay, it does that. And um, this, uh, this last part is Christian stuff, but this is, you know, Jewish theologians uh, are far clearer about this than most Christian exegetes. Yes? So how then does the first commandment protect that gift? Does this mean you shall have no other altars then? No, quite practically. Okay, I uh, just listen to you. There will not be for you any other gods of Panay. Against, literally in my presence, against my presence, in defiance of my presence, uh, in connection with my presence. Now, in practical terms, if you take in light of it, it uh, means, think practically, not theor theoretically. What does God forbid in the first commandment? And I'm jumping ahead a bit, but it doesn't matter. What does God forbid him? Worship of other gods before you are idols. Yes. It's idols. You are not allowed to place any idol in my presence. That's quite clear. You know, because it, then you get the you shall not make any idols, things in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. You shall not prostrate yourself before them, and you shall not perform service to them. Why? Because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, etc. You know, well. Um, uh, in practical terms, no, this is not theoretical monotheism, this is practical monotheism. Uh, it means that you must not have an idol of Yahweh or uh, uh, literally, first of all, of any other God in my presence. And that means there's not allowed to be any idol of any other God in the temple. Um, uh, but it also means and that's quite clear um, if you look at the whole uh, theology of idolatry uh, that they're not allowed to even make an idol of the Lord. And there's a hidden thing there. If they make an idol of the Lord, they're not accessing the Lord, but they're accessing yeah. another God. <laughs> you know? um, they are they're worshipping the right God, but in the wrong way. In the contrary to the way that God has forbidden. Now, this is something that Lutheran, Lutherans and Lutherans were very, very clear about, but we've forgotten in worship, and we're very, very careless about what we do in worship. Remember the three things: we have mandata, prohibitiva, the mandated things in worship, the prohibited things, and then you've got adiaphora. Uh, uh, and we must make sure that. Uh, we worship God as he has instituted and not do anything that he has prohibited. So what you just said is, a, is another way of, of giving definition to our <coughs> uh, dogmatic labels of orthodox churches, heterodox churches, and then you have what would it be? 
Heter Carl. Heretical church. Heretical church. Yes. That, so, so a heterodox church is a group of people or a theology that worships the right God, but in the wrong way. That's why. That's one of the ways, yes. Uh, or there's another way of looking at it, and, and I find that um, I owe this uh, to uh, Dr. Zasser, who's very, very clear on this. And he said, quite all too often we Lutherans confuse heresy and wrong doctrine or false doctrine. Now, uh, so you have teaching doctrine, and t teaching primarily is practical. Um, uh, it's teaching to do, and what to do, and why to do it, and how to do it. So, and uh, all of Christian doctrine ultimately focuses on worship, right worship. Okay. Um, there is, uh, you know, if you like, there's the Catholic tradition, uh, which is codified in the creeds, particularly in the Nicene Creed. Now, um, uh, if a church, uh, oh, yeah, let me go. Yeah, I've got to make sure I don't confuse you. to be distinguished. Heresy places you outside the church. Uh, it places you outside the divine service. Now, uh, uh, a person is a heretic if they uh, do not confess the ecumenical creed, which is, what is the ecumenical creed? Try and God. Okay. okay, it is the Nicene Creed. Okay. We have two creeds in the West. There's the Apostles' Creed, which is the uh, uh, baptismal creed. But the ecumenical creed, which determines whether you uh, belong to the one holy Catholic Church or not, is the Nicene Creed. Anybody who denies one of the articles of faith in the Nicene Creed is what? A heretic. A heretic. They're outside the church. Okay? Now, uh, uh, then within the church, you get, and, and this is where I spoke about sectarian yesterday, okay? Outs, you think of the circle. And I just, look, I just find this so helpful, it's so practical, okay? Remember Zasa's circle? Okay, now what's the center of the circle? justification. There's something prior to justification. You, if you have justification apart from this, then you get heresy. You can have teaching. There's modern Lutherans who have the heretics. They emphasize justification. Somebody like Bultmann, I'd say, is basically a heretic. And he is a very influential Lutheran theologian. He made the word. No, it's more fundamental than that. Christ. He denies Christ and his resurrection. He denies the resurrection of Jesus. And so his Christology is defective. The center of the circle is Christ or the triune God. Okay? Um, this, uh, uh, is Christ. Uh, that's what I'd say. And justification is then one of the, is the in a secondary sense, I, the central article that holds all the spokes together. Well, what's, if you like, then you, with the outer circle is described by the uh, Nicene Creed. Okay? If you are out, if you deny any of the articles of the outside uh, of the Nicene Creed, you're outside the circle. You don't belong to the Una Santa. You don't belong to the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Now, um, within the church, so that's heresy. Heresy puts you outside. 
Now, um, uh, as you know, within Christendom, there are many different denominations, and that's a bit of a problem. That we, we Lutherans, despite our strictness, would recognize, say, Anglicans and Catholics, and even Baptists, provided they actually practice baptism in the name of the triune God, as being Orthodox Christians. Why? Because they hold to the content of the Nicene Creed. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, then uh, false doctrine is uh, taking, uh, there's two kinds of false doctrine. They are, uh, you know, uh, emphasizing taking some of the articles of faith and ignoring others. Now that's one. Um, you don't necessarily deny the other articles of faith, but say um, you emphasize about the end of the world or uh, you emphasize the Holy Spirit and you sideline Christology. You don't deny it, it's just practically, you don't teach it. Or you teach it wrongly. Uh, you deny justification by grace through faith. Uh, so the two kinds of false doctrine, there are those, it's a question of emphasis, but then you also, there's the other one, where you take this and you add something uh, that is contradictory to this. Right, so uh, our aim always is right doctrine, uh, right practice. Um, in, uh, can any of you claim that you have all your teaching and preaching is right doctrine, right practice? Luther says you can aim for right doctrine, but you uh, and but you never achieve right practice. Um, uh, right doctrine, yes, in terms of this, yes in terms of what we confess. Um, but none of you, uh, I am aware that I've, uh, I'm still learning you know, the whole of the church, uh, the Christian faith. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I'm a heretic, I'm outside the church. It means that my teaching is defective in some way. Now, I hope that hasn't uh, confused you. Uh, it's, this has become more and more important to me the more you know, the longer I'm in the church and people engaging with other churches as an instrument to judge you know, what our relationships should be with them. Yes? Uh, Scare has a recent article on CTQ and you know, he always pokes fun or makes us think about how we speak and say as Lutherans and he talked about census literalis, yes. you know, and you talked about the historic sense of census yes, literalis yes, yes. in terms of the intended meaning of the text, yes. the rich yes. pregnant text, yes. or pregnant yes. meaning. But he also talks about, you know, we talk about the uh, justification as the article in which the church is either standing or falling. And he, and he says in, in this article, it's actually, uh, it is the Christ who justifies. Yes. That's the center. Yes, and, and you've got to watch out because these are, are, are analogies, and like all analogies, pictures, they have limitations. It's put best of all by the Augsburg Confession. It's interesting that justification by grace is not the first article. Do you know what the first article? And more and more scholars say how beautiful... Melanchthon had a, a lovely ordered mind. Uh, he wasn't always right. But I love reading him because he's got such, and you can see, it's, it's, it's a beautifully ordered mind. Uh, he uses language well, he's careful with his concepts, his word, he, he writes well, he uses good language, he's just got an ordered mind. And you can see it in the Augsburg Confession. What's the first article? God. God. Which God? Triune God. No, it's not generic God, it's triune God. That's the foundation, okay? If you like, that's this. Okay? Uh, even if you teach justification, but don't tr teach the triune trinity, uh, you're teaching heresy. Uh, secondly, and this is most important, uh, particularly in our modern world, which denies this, the second article is on original sin. Original sin. You won't make sense of Christology and justification and ministry and the church unless you uh, have uh, the right doctrine of sin. 
Now, uh, uh, scholars point out that at least the first part of the Oxford Confession is carefully um, organized. You have always one article deals with God, and then the next article deals with the opposite of that, man. Try and God, sin. What's the third article? The Son of God. The Son of God. And the full Son of God. Full Christology. And what's the fourth article? Justification. And it, now, uh, to say that justification is the central article doesn't mean it's first or foundational. What's foundational? This and this. And you can say in some sense, from anthropology, that's from uh, uh, understanding from a human point of view, uh, man, sin, here, yeah, comes before that. Justification makes no sense except against the backdrop of original sin, total depravity. Now you go on further, okay, you can see the pattern, I'll just take up to Article 6, what's the next article? And it's very interesting where it's placed. Credit hmm? The office of ministry. Yeah. Now it's the office of ministry. Credit out. And then what's the next article? The new obedience. And then you get uh, the church. The two, uh, the church itself is up here, and then um, uh, then uh, the church from a human point of view comes down here. But notice it's very significant that office of ministry is placed on this line rather than on this line. Now, how do I get here? Okay, justification central. Um, to say it's central doesn't mean it's foundation. Uh, these things are prior to it. Uh, and I'm, I haven't seen Scare's article, but uh, um, yeah, uh, to, 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 I know him well enough. Um, that's the way I'd understand the point that he's making, which is correct. He's, he writes very polemically, and sometimes that puts me off. Uh, it's also very interesting and engaging. <laughs> Okay, now anything else just on that area before I move on? Uh, okay. Now, the first theme that I want to look at, how's time going? Uh, we go to... 10.15. Okay, we've got 15 minutes to uh, start off. Okay, the Exodus, the first theme of Exodus is Exodus. The deliverance of the Israelites by God uh, from slavery in Egypt. That's the foundational theme. Um, okay, now, um, in order to understand uh, uh, the uh, deliverance of God co correctly and everything else that follows, we need to be absolutely certain about the status of the Israelites who were in slavery to Egypt. <coughs> Now, there is a, an interpretation of Exodus and the Old Testament, a modern one, which goes back to Karl Barth. He's done a great deal of good, but he's also created a great deal of problem in the church. He understands, in the light of his reform tradition, that the uh, descendants of Abraham become the people of God at Mount Sinai. So the covenant at Mount Sinai, the redemption from, you know, he took people who were slaves and he made them his people and he made a covenant with them as his people at Mount Sinai. So his basic reading is before the Exodus, before Mount Sinai, the Israelites were not the people of God. You with me? Now it's quite clear if you read Exodus even um, uh, quite clearly that the Israelites already the people of God. What does God say to Pharaoh? Let my people, people go. They are already the people of God. Now I need to uh, make a, for what, to make sense of what follows, 
I need to uh, explain very carefully two precise terms in Hebrew. Uh, let my people go, the term is um, which means basically kinsfolk. Oh, I misspelled it. Kinsfolk, extended family, people as an ethnic group. So, uh, the people of God is the family of God. God's extended, it's not a nuclear family, it's the extended family. Um, and remember, it's uh, not just Abraham, but the 12 sons of uh, uh, Jacob. Um, and they're, uh, tri you know, so it's, it's a tribal uh, definition. Now, they are already the people of God before the covenant of Mount Sinai. Now, uh, the second term that's very important is, but they become, what do they become at Mount Sinai? They become Goy Kadosh, a holy nation. Now, Goy is a nation as a cultural, religious, social entity. So the, the, the family of God becomes, if you like, the holy family of God. They become a unique nation that is defined religiously, liturgically, uh, a, a holy nation. Okay, um, okay. Uh, so the people of God were already, the, peop the Israelites were already the people of God before Sinai, they are God's firstborn son. Um, let's go to uh, uh, the passage we had a look at before, but it's very, very important. Uh, Dwight, could you read Exodus 4, 20 to 23? Beginning with verse 20. Yes. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride at a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. For I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. You refuse to let him go. Behold, I will kill your firstborn son. But Israel is what? God's firstborn son. Now, what is significant about firstborn son in the Old Testament? They inherit. Okay. They inherit the family name and family property. property. Um, now, we need to understand it uh, in terms of ancient terms. It doesn't mean that the rest of the children don't get anything, but you don't want to divide the farm. You don't want to f divide the property. The head of the property farm is the firstborn son. He gets use of two-thirds of the revenue from it. Um, a next son will only get a third. The firstborn son inherits the family name, inherits the family estate, uh, uh, is the head of the family. So takes over from the previous head of the family. That's the first thing. The firstborn son also um, uh, particularly in the light of the Exodus, has a new significance. The firstborn son is holy to God. Why holy to God? If you think in terms of the, uh, the great plagues, when God destroyed all the firstborn sons, both of human beings and animals, in Egypt, he spared the Israelite firstborn sons, both of human beings and animals. And since God spared them, what does that mean? They're his. they're his. Can you see? And if they're his, they're holy to God. They belong to God. They're God's property. They belong to God. And um, this meant that the Israelites, if they want, you know, say for example, the head of the family, the firstborn son, if he wanted to assume his role, in family life, it'd have to be redeemed. What does redeem mean? Bought back. Bought from God. So you have to pay God to get your son back. 
Now, what would happen with the firstborn male animals? They will be killed and offered to God. And what would God do then? He'd give the meat from them. Uh, if you had a donkey that you couldn't sacrifice, the firstborn one had to be killed or redeemed. You had to pay God the value of that animal. No, so Israel is God's firstborn son. Uh, uh, in a very real sense. Thirdly, the Israelites, the descendants of Israel, are God's servants. Now, servants doesn't mean slave. It means they worship God. Now, going all the way back to Abraham, Abraham was to teach the way of the Lord to his children and uh, grandchildren. They were to serve the Lord. They were to be servants of the Lord. Now, what is the atrocity that Pharaoh is guilty of? It's not just a case of social political injustice. He doesn't just take a group of this ethnic group and enslave them, but he steals these people from God. So he steals the people that belong to God, God's family, God's people, and he enslaves them. And worse than that, they are holy, therefore what does he do? He's the worship of they make them worship his own. What does he do then by making them worship his idols? Serve him? These are. They're holy, therefore what does he do? He desecrates God's holy. He's guilty of sacrilege. Um, now, one of the very interesting themes of Exodus is that uh, God did not abandon his people in Egypt. But he accompanied them when they went down to Egypt, and he uh, 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 joined them there. And already, before the Exodus occurred, before he sent Moses, he says that he has visited his people. Okay, and this is rather interesting because you have Moses going down. And I would expect then Moses going down to uh, Egypt, that God sends Moses, and by sending Moses, God visits his people in slavery in Egypt. But God tells Moses that he has already visited his people. Now, there's a very important word that's used here, uh, which uh, uh, is almost impossible to give the sense of in English. In Hebrew, the word for visit is pakwav. Just before we do, just uh, can we go back to, uh, can we look at uh, Exodus 3, 8 and 16, those two verses, Bob? Exodus 3, 8. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land. Okay, that'll do. Okay. I have come down. The first verb that's used there is Yarav. God descends, come down, has joined his people. That's the first one. Now go to the second one. 16. Yes. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying... I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. Okay, concerned about you, almost impossible translation. Hebrew is, I have visited you. Now, um, uh, let me explain the use of this term, visit. Um, it comes from uh, uh, the it's bureaucratic language in... Um, the kingdoms of the ancient world. Now, it's, it's managerial kind of language, and you get the equivalence to the present day. Okay, you have a king in a central location. He rules the world, uh, no, he rules his nation or the empire with his royal officials, his governors. Now, um, every now and then, the king or his deputy would visit the governor. Let's just say a governor. Um, so you have the king of Egypt would go and visit 
the governor of Upper Egypt. What would be the point of the visitation? Things are managed well. Things that, that things are managed well. Okay? And the focus would be on, you know, good administration. What else would it be involved in the visitation? Remind the governor that the king's in charge. To just tell him, okay, don't forget, you're not the boss. You work for the boss. I'm boss. Um, and the royal official, the governor, in fact, would be afraid of any visitation. Why? Because the visitor, by the way, that's the term bishop, uh, wouldn't just check up that things were going right in the kingdom, but who would he check up on? The governor. The governor. Okay, and what would happen then? He'd check up, what about the governor? Is he corrupt? Is he, Is he corrupt? Fair? Is he fair? Is, Is he, he doing he... his job properly? Is he derelict? Is he collecting and the taxes? Is he collecting the taxes? <laughs> and is he keeping the taxes? Um, uh, okay, he checks up on the official, and this would determine what? What he would do with the official. What he'd do with the official. Now, I'll spell that out. Well, whether he would, uh, I guess, bless him or say, he, you know, if he's doing a good job, maybe give him promotion or some sort. Okay. Or whether he may even execute him for yes. doing badly. Okay, there's two possible. If he was doing things right, he will reward him, increase the salary for him, benefits, give him, uh, uh, give him uh, new titles, honours, and titles always went with extra money or benefits. He'd give him more land or something like that. And if he's doing really well, then he'd, he'd promote him. On the other hand, if he was corrupt, not doing it, he would penalise him, dock his salary, or even... Uh, demote him. Worst of all, he wouldn't just demote him, he'd sack him, and if it was really corrupt, he would kill him. Now, okay, God comes to visit his people. Before the Israelites cry to God, before God calls a, 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 a Moses and sends him to Egypt, God has already done and ordered. He's checked things out. He's found out what's been going on. He has visited uh, his official. Uh, by the way, the term in Greek for visit is episcopio, uh, from which we get episcopi, and uh, the term bishop. Uh, Visitations. Now, part of your job as president is, president is to engage in visitation. This is oversight. I term, the other term is oversight. The term that Lutherans used for their presidents in Germany was superintendent. A superintendent is a person who exercises oversight, not by sitting at home, you know, uh, there uh, at head, you know, in the cathedral but engaging in visitation. The visitation is to check up the congregation. Now, we modern Lutherans, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, have lost uh, the importance of, uh, I don't care what you call it, president or superintendent or bishop. It's all the same thing in practical terms. What the role of a president is. The president is not a CEO, he has to do with managing the church, but it's to exercise oversight. In case that's another little side, that's for you, for your benefit, Randy, <laughs> and for the benefit of these guys to understand uh, what your job is. And not to be scared of visitations, because the whole purpose of visitation, again, is not to punish officials, but to do what? Okay, what's the purpose of the visitation of the king of his governor and a province? Well, no, no, that's incidental. That's it. What's the ultimate goal? To make sure it's really done well. Good of the kingdom. The good of the kingdom. Yeah. The benefit of the people. Not for the benefit, his own benefit. It's that the people benefit. And that the arrangement of the whole province is such that the people prosper. What's the, ben what's the point of a pastoral or episcopal or presidential visitation? 
spiritual concern of people. The yeah. spiritual concern of people. No yeah. spiritual concern. It's not to check that it's running as a good business, but that the spiritual needs of the people are being met and that the congregation is prospering spiritually, which means also that the pastor's prospering spiritually. That's, that's really wonderful. And if we're going to weather the pressures in the church for the next hundred years, I think, uh, we need to rediscover. That's a little bit of an aside. I hope you don't mind that. Um, but that's this term here. God is visiting his people um, to check up on them in order to set what, what the right, the things that are wrong, to help his people, to prosper his people. Any questions on that? Okay, now comes uh, a, a very interesting okay, uh, a little snippet. At the end of chapter 2, um, uh, we read, you know, there's the, the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh uh, basically uh, enslaves the people of Israel. They're engaged in building, in his great building projects. Uh, he's building two very important new cities. He needs cheap labour. He needs uh, uh, cheap workers so that the economy prospers. And so he enslaves the Israelites. And in that way, he tries to wipe them out because they are reproducing so quickly that it looks as if they are likely to take over the kingdom. That's his fear. Okay, so they are enslaved. And at the end of chapter 2, and just before the call of Moses, we read the following. It's a beautifully crafted little uh, uh, two sentences. In fact, it's one sentence in Hebrew. The Israelites groaned from their slavery and cried out to help, and their cry came up to God from their slavery. Now, do you notice the three steps there? And do you notice anything about those three steps? The Israelites groaned from their slavery. Groaning is an inarticulate prayer. It's not yet a prayer. Groaning? Oh. Well, it's complaining, but it's not directed. Status. Yeah, status. Yeah, it has to do with the status, which is they are oppressed. It's, it's that they are expressing what the way the slavery affects them. So it's a, an inarticulate form of expression. They are expressing their grief, their pain, their hurt, their anger. But it's not directed anywhere yet. First of all, the groaning. Then what's the second thing? They cry out for help. Who do they cry out for help? It's not, it's no one. No, groaning, first of all, that's the emotional side. Then they articulate, they cry to help. And finally, God grace us by hearing them. Yeah, well, that's not yet. They cry out, and their cry came up to God. God from their slavery. Finally, they cried to God for help. They lament to God. By the way, that's a classical description of the Psalms of lament. You're in trouble, you express your trouble, and then you direct your uh, uh, frustration, your anger, your pain uh, to God. But notice that it starts off... Uh, 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 not being directed to God. And then you get the three responses of God. It's very interesting. Um, and notice that this comes before God calls Moses. Um, the answer to this uh, is the call of Moses. Then God does four things. First of all, I'll read, then God heard their groaning. And notice the repetition of God. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the Israelites, and God knew. By the way, there's uh, uh, some misplaced uh, reference there. The first things, God heard their groaning. Notice it's already before they pray, God hears their groaning. Uh, he hears their groaning. Um, and then the second thing is he remembers his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, um, uh, remember in Hebrew, 
is primarily not a, just a mental act, but it's remember to do something. <coughs> so it's not as if God has had a memory lapse and he's forgotten that he's made the covenant, but he, uh, just as I remember the birthday of my wife by buying her present and shouting her a party, so God remembers his covenant how? By acting. <coughs> doing something about their groaning. That's the second one. And then thirdly, most mysteriously, God saw the Israelites. Here we get that verb seeing again, which is so important in Exodus. In what sense did God see his people? Of course, he saw them all the time. But remember this. He sees what? What? They're broken. He sees their groans, and what lies behind their groans? Their affliction. their affliction, their suffering. And uh, uh, in Hebrew, by the way, there's no verb for experience. Mm. If you experience something, the verb that's used is see. Uh, you know, experiencing life is seeing life. God experiences their suffering. Now, this is going to be clear in uh, the next chapter. He identifies with them. He uh, gets involved with them. He sees their suffering. He suffers with them. And then you get a mysterious riddle, and God knew. Now, most translations don't uh, 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 take liberty with the text. God knew. Now, in English as in Hebrew, the verb know is a transitive verb. What's funny about saying, and God knew? It's treated as if it's intransitively, but you know there always has to be an object. So you have he knew, and there's a question mark. He knew, what's the question mark? What? Them. They suffered. Okay, he knew their and that's quite clear the next chapter, oh, okay. that he knew their suffering. Can you go to 3.7, since you got it there, Bob? 3.7. Now, do you have... RSV or? This is New American Standard. Okay, ESV. Has somebody got English Standard yes. Version? Okay, can you have it? Yeah. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their past masters. I know their suffering. I know what? Their suffering. Now, in what sense is no used here? Just, oh, yes, I know about it. Well, it's the same use of no as Adam knowing his yeah. wife Eve. Intimate. Intimate involvement with them. He gets down and dirty with them. Uh, and he uh, identifies with them. He joins them in their suffering. He knows their suffering. He suffers with them. So you get those four uh, responses to the cry for God. God hears the groaning. God remembers the covenant, God sees his people and their affliction, and he knows, he experiences, he becomes involved with, he suffers with them. <coughs> this is a God who suffers with his people. Um, and from that point of view, not from a God who's absent and uh, looks at uh, his people from afar, but God who gets down, down and dirty with his people in their pain and suffering. And then his response is the call of Moses. Just one last thing before we have morning tea. Um, groaning. Do you remember where Paul picks up that verb? We don't know how to pray, but the Spirit, uh, Spirit helps us in our weakness. Um, you have the, the groaning of all creation, and then you have the groaning of our groaning, which the Spirit then takes, uh, uses to intercede with God for us. Where does Paul get this from? It's this passage here in Exodus 2. God hears their groaning, and he reads their groaning already before they make a prayer. And Paul picks it up and says it's the Spirit that intercedes within us and turns our groaning under oppression into a perfect prayer according to the will of God. Let's take a break.
hope breaks Dr. Clement. In Psalm 1, verse 6. Skip to one. Just stop. 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 Uh, no, we're going to turn it off. Thanks. We should stop on this one. Stop. New topic. Um, <clears throat> remember the call of Moses, the incident of the burning bush. Uh, strange thing. Um, there's fire and God reveals himself to Moses in the fire. Um, let's <coughs> read the... I've got it on, thank you. Uh, the... Uh, call of Moses, at least the first part of it, uh, chapter 3, 1 through to 15. Chris, could you read that, please? Sorry, chapter 3, 1 to 15. Okay. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Notice the mountain of God. I was talking about that yesterday. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Just stop there. There's a very important verb there, kara. So God calling, his vocation of Moses. He addresses Moses. Um, but then the whole call is what follows. Keep going. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. A land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Um, 
just putting up the Hebrew for the last little couplet. It's a little poem. Okay, now it doesn't matter if you can't read that. Now, um, God calls Moses, God commissions Moses, he sends him. Send here, in uh, that very technical sense, like apostle, means com uh, sending, commissioning, authorizing. So God authorizes Moses, he calls Moses, he sends Moses to deliver his people. Okay, first thing. Now, put yourself in Moses' shoes. He's a fugitive from justice. He's one person, old man really, uh, and he's taking on the, um, the head of the superpower in the ancient world. Not just the political superpower, the not economic superpower, but the spiritual superpower in the ancient world. And um, what does uh, God give him then, to so that he can? What's his instrument? What's the only thing that God gives him to equip him for the task? He gives him two things. His name. Well, first of all, before the name, he gives the promise of his. Presence. Just let it do. Um, says, God says, I will be with you. And this will be a sign that I, I have sent you. When you brought the people of Egypt, uh, uh, people out from Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. The sign is no use because the sign's going to be only after the event. <laughs> That's a funny, it's a future sign. So it's not, no help to Moses. Two puny weapons. The promise of God's presence and the holy name, the name of God. Okay, um, and with these two weapons, he's going to take on the superpower in the ancient world. Now, I've already spoken about the holy name, um, uh, so I won't go in great detail, and I'll come back to this, but just the holy name is the Tetragrammaton. Those four letters. And it's related to the verb to be. I am. So uh, uh, when he comes to Egypt, the Israelites say, who sent you? Um, he says, I am has sent me. And who's that? Um, I will be who I will be. And uh, the meaning of the name is not important, but the name itself is the thing. Now, as I said yesterday, you need to distinguish between three different kinds of names, which I find that people confuse enormously. You talk about the names of God. Um, there's, first of all, the, this is God's personal name. What we'd say is his proper name. Um, okay. Uh, what's the difference between this and God. What kind of a name is God? Title. No, it's not a title. It's what we call in grammar a. Oh, okay. okay. Writing in Hebrew. Is yes, somebody said it? I heard a whisper. Common name. Common name. Common name. Like tree. <coughs> um, common name. It's a. Uh, 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 the name used for a class of things, a common name, God. Now, what's the problem with the, the name God, Elohim? It can be used for any God. Or you can use it particularly, so it can be used as a kind of a proper name. You can address God, and you can use the common name as a proper name. Um, just as my children can use the title Father, which is a title or a common name, probably better, um, for, and, and use it as a personal name for me, like that. And then the third kind of name is title. Let's go to the New Testament and see if you can uh, uh, work out the difference. Name Jesus. Which one of these? Is 
personal person. Personal name. His personal human name. The son? Common. Common. It sounds like a common name, but it in fact is a... Title. No. And it sounds like a title, but the way it's used in the New Testament is it's... It's used as a personal name. Because uh, uh, it's correlated with the Father. What is God's person? The, what is the personal name for the first person of the Trinity? Okay, I believe in God who? The Father, the, Father, the Almighty. Now, what's Almighty? A title. Okay? So, I believe in God. That's a common name. Which God? The Father, proper name, <coughs> almighty title, maker of heaven and earth. Um, also kind of, it's, it's actually a title, um, extended title. Okay, I believe in Jesus Christ. Title, very important. The anointed one, the Messiah, the anointed one. Uh, Jesus Christ, his only son, Lord it sounds like a title. It sounds like a title, but it's personal name again. So, what is the personal? What is the personal name of Jesus? It's a composite name, just as my personal name is John Wilfred Kleinig. You get the personal name of Jesus. Is Jesus? No, that's title. That's Christ, God's Son, not even, or the Son of the Father and Lord. Uh, personal names. Now, God gives Moses his personal name. Now, Australians are very careless with names um, and are very relaxed with names. Uh, Americans are sort of halfway between Australians and Germans. Germans are very strict, at least traditionally, with names. Um, and uh, uh, you, in Germany, you have two different forms in German, uh, yeah, Germany, with the German language. You have two different forms of address. Uh, you have Z, which is the polite form, and you have Du, which is the familiar form. Um, there are very few German people who I would dare address as Du. And a very important stage of the relationship, they say, Du kannst mir Du sein which is mean you can address me as do, which would be equivalent in English to say, call me John, um, which is the familiar term, the intimate term. Okay, now, um, um, let me uh, give you a number of different possibilities by which I introduce myself. Now, first of all, what's the importance of self-introduction or somebody else introducing you? give someone else access to you. Okay. When you introduce yourself, you give people access to you. If somebody else introduces you, that person gives uh, that the other person access to you. Okay, so quite often, say, you know me, I haven't met Randy, you say, uh, John, uh, Randy, this is John. Or, uh, okay, you introduce him to me. Or you say, this is President Golda. Uh, Dr. Klein. Now, what's the difference between the following forms of self-introduction? Hello, I'm Dr. Kleinig. Hello, I'm Mr. Kleinig. Hello, I'm Pastor Kleinig. Hello, I am uh, John. Okay, it has to do with authority, but remember that uh, uh, introductions have to do with access to yourself. Mm -hmm. Say, if uh, uh, I say I'm Dr. Kleinig, I'm not just saying, you know, I'm an important person, but what kind of access am I giving to you? Student-teacher student 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 teacher yeah. relationship. Doctor is teacher, so student-teacher, academic-student. Okay? So, uh, I'd use that in academic context. It's a student-teacher relationship. It's fairly limited. So you, I give them access to me in, in connection with their studies. 
Um, and by saying that, I wouldn't ex- I'd expect them maybe to knock at my office, but they wouldn't come and visit me at home. And I don't give them permission to visit me at home. Okay? I am Dr. Kleinick. Let's say that. Okay, that's number one. I'm Mr. Kleinick. Professional in the common... Kind of yes, a public domain. Okay? It's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's public, it's, it's professional or vocational in the public domain. Kind of a private citizen address. Yes, private citizen, but it's public. So, and uh, anybody then, it gives, it's, it's by far the most, uh, uh, the least intimate. Mr. Kleine gets very formal, okay, uh, very limited access, but it, it's within the public domain, whereas doctor is within the academic domain, okay. Uh, the one that I use most of all, I'm Pastor Kleine. Okay, then I'm giving people access to myself as their pastor. I'm offering a pastoral relationship. Okay, now third, lastly, I've lost, lost track of it, uh, John. Very intimate. Very intimate. Okay, now in, in some kind of cultures, like a traditional German culture, who would dare to call me John in Germany? Family. Not all family, even. Family. My wife? My siblings. best, not yeah, my siblings. So brothers and sisters would call me John, and my parents would call me John. My grandparents would call me John, but my cousins probably wouldn't call me John. Now that's a bit hazy. Um, would any friend call me John? Only close friend, and that would mark the transition from being, you know, a uh, no, acquaintance, general friend, to an intimate friend and a very close friendship. So this is very significant in stage in friendship. Who comes to me do this and call me John. Um, okay, now, um, when would your children call you John? And call me John. <laughs> yeah? Just before they get a beating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Things are the same the world over. Yes. <laughs> okay, it's when they are grown up. And it marks the transition from being a child to an adult child. Um, those couples. Now, we, uh, I think, uh, you know, as I say, uh, I, the US is uh, a little bit more formal than Australia. I've never been called sir so much as here in the States. Um, that's another one. Uh, I won't talk about that. Now, one last one, one that I use a great deal. Hello, I'm Pastor John. Now, what's significant about that one? You're using your baptismal name. Well, John is the baptismal name, and the also then pastor in in the pastoral relationship. Mm-hmm. You know? So, uh, very very uh, intimate um, in terms of pastoral care of people and offering them um, a a very close pastoral relationship. Okay, well what do you do when you, besides, okay, names then, names give you access to a person, and so when you give a name to a person, what are you giving by giving access? Use of yourself. Use of yourself. You actually give people the gift of yourself. You offer yourself, you present yourself, you give yourself to people. Now, and it it depends on the relationship as the degree of intimacy and the kind of relationship that I've been touching on. Okay, so if God says to his people, not just Moses, but the Israelites, I am Yahweh, what's he giving? Himself and his personal name. His personal name, access to himself. And it's not just access to himself, but access to everything that belongs to God. Um, He's giving himself, and it's the gracious name. Why is it the name of grace? That's The Jews sometimes use that term. Um, It's the gracious name. I'm thinking benediction. Okay, and that's one example of that, because if if you have an intimate relationship, 
you give people permission to ask for help and ask for favours. So it's not a professional relationship where it's, it's very, very formal and what you can require of people and seek of people is governed by law. With personal names you go from law, custom to grace. Um, you use that to access grace, the grace of a person, the generosity, handout, benefits, whatever you like, benevolence. Um, I still remember one dramatic occasion. Uh, I was in a class in Cambridge uh, in the School of Oriental Studies where my teacher was a very, very learned rabbi and I was the only Christian in a class of 11 students. Ten of them were not just Jews but observant Jews. You know, they wore the whole... <coughs> And this, this was, a, a, you know, a Jew's Jew. He was a very observant, very strict rabbi, a very learned man. And um, he didn't, re he thought, um, uh, now because most of them were Jews and he didn't know who I was, he assumed I was a Jew uh, <laughs> because everybody else was a Jew. And so I heard a lot of in, kind of in-house stuff. Um, and I still remember, this has nothing to do with what learning, he spoke about that silly Christian notion of loving your enemies. <laughs> that silly Christian notion. Why? Because uh, uh, my enemies are God's enemies. What does God do? How is, what's God's attitude to his enemies? He hates them. Because they hate him. Therefore, you hate your enemies. That was his argument. You can see, uh, from his point of view, it makes good sense if you think in terms of law rather than grace. It hadn't struck me before how remarkable those words of Jesus, in fact, were, how countercultural all cultures. Um, he just laid it straight out there, quite frankly. But uh, the most dramatic was uh, when he said, he asked the question in class. He says, uh, said, uh, brothers, uh, what is the greatest gift that the Holy One, who is blessed forever, has given to his people Israel. He paused for effect. Nobody dare answer because his questions always were trick questions. <laughs> uh, and you're scared of saying the wrong answer. And then he lifted his finger and he said, Hashem, the name. And he was right. The greatest gift that God has ever given to Israel is this holy name. <clears throat> Why? Because by giving that name, he gives everything else. That bundles up everything. And it's not just, doesn't just apply for Old Testament, but applies for New Testament. Except the greatest gift is not this name, but which name? It's not Jesus. Jesus. And the Jesus, which is part of the Trinitarian name. Uh, baptized, notice it's singular. Baptized in the name, name. not the names, yeah. of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, the greatest gift that God's given us is summarized there in the Apostles and Nicene Creed. Have you ever noticed that first of all you have the names of God and then you have the deeds of God. But the names of God take priority over the deeds of God. And the proper names take priority over the common name God and titles. The greatest gift that God has given to us as Christians is the name of Jesus, his Son, the Lord. Uh, God has manifested his name to us, the, the first of the Trinity, his Father. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And with that, then he's given us everything. Everything else comes from that. Yes? I'm struggling a bit in terms God. of... <laughs> if in terms of the hesitancy for the Israelites or the Jews yes. to pronounce the personal name, yes. if the Lord has given his name for them to use yes. and to speak, it would seem like it would be a sin of omission to not speak his name. Yep. 
and, and therefore you ought to speak his name by faith and use it in the proper way. Yes. So what is the hesitancy for not speaking the personal name, even though it has a curse upon it if you misuse it? But it would, seem, it would be the same with, with the name of Jesus. Yes. Uh, if you misuse, speak that, you use it in a wrong way or without faith, then that would be very hurtful too because the name brings his presence. That's right. right up. And that's an excellent question and uh, it touches right on the heart of the dilemma of Judaism, if I can call it that. Uh, the name is the most holy of all holy things because the name sanctifies everything. So, uh, the name is the most holy of all holy things, which means what? What's the worst act of desecration? Is the desecration of the, <coughs> the name. There's no act of desecration that's worse than that. Have you ever pondered on the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, or who art in heaven? What? <coughs> Thy name. Which name? Father. Uh, uh, somewhat the same thinking. Okay. Now, if it's mo if it's the most holy name, what's the worst uh, thing you can do? Is misuse, abuse, desecrate the holy name. Uh, now, I can't give you the full history, but uh, uh, you need to go through the whole history of Israel um, and the, the the discussion about desecration of the name, particularly in Ezekiel. And one of the reasons for the exit, one of the reasons for the exile was, you remember, do you know Ezekiel well enough? That God had given them his name, he'd given them land, and by means of the land and the temple and everything, he gave them great gifts. And what did Israel do in the land? The worst thing they did was to defile and desecrate his name. And because they desecrated his most holy name, therefore God destroys the temple, kicks them off the land. Why did that happen? Because they desecrated that holy name. So guess what happened when they came back from exile? The teachers, the rabbis, the priests made sure that the exile wouldn't happen again. How? By restricting, not using. It's, it's not. They restricted the use of the name. And you can see it happening. And that meant... Uh, since it's a holy name, where alone could you use it? At the temple. At the temple. The holy name is given for access to the holy God at the holy place, in the holy way, in the divine service. Now, you see the way it is? So, outside the temple, then, you, that, they began to use, when they read the scriptures, this is where the term Adonai comes in. They began to use the term Adonai, Lord. And Adonai, then... Is uh, is the, uh, the, the, the the is not just a title here, but becomes the proper name for God in common usage outside the temple. Now notice that so that's Lord. Uh, as time went on, guess what happened? The restrictions became more and more severe. But then, what happens then when the temple is destroyed? One they, have access to they have no access to God's grace here on earth. There's no temple. There's no means of grace. There's no sacrifices. There's no atonement. All that's lost is so they are no longer able to use the holy name. Now that's the dilemma of Judaism. And you won't understand the Mishnah and the Talmud and the whole rabbinical tradition except uh, from the point of view, they say, now, we've lost all the great gifts that God's given us. Okay, God gave us the land, we've lost the land. God gave us the kingship, we've lost the kingship. God's given up, gave, gave us the divine service, the temple, we've lost that. What have we got left? The teaching. Torah. The Torah. And hence, you get a new... Uh, a reconfiguration of Judaism around the Torah. So the whole Torah uh, religion, if you like, of Judaism begins only with the destruction of the temple. Uh, and that's the dilemma that Judaism is in to the present day. Yes, they can use a proper name of God, but not the name, not the Tetragrammaton, they use this one. 
Satan. And they have a special spelling of it. It's not Adonai with a short I, but a long I. It reads like a plural. Um, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, especially. So that's the name. Now, this is very significant then, then if I can uh, lead you through to the Christian um, Christianity, because this then in Greek is Kyrios. What's the basic confession of faith? Jesus. Jesus. Kyrios. No, Jesus Lord. It's not even the is there. Jesus Lord. Now, um, how do we understand that kurios? Meaning, say that Jesus is who? No. no. And coming out of that, and it's because of that, then kurios is not a title right from the beginning, but kurios is a proper name. Yes? Just a no problem. In Byzantine iconography, the and the halo and the cross behind Christ's head, there's yes. always the ha-on. Ha-on, yes. And that, 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 that sorry, and uh, there was, this hymn, the hymn we sang this morning was magnificent. There's only one thing that I, you know, besides the term Jehovah, you know how that comes about, but they identify who as Lord, the, the great I am, is the Father. Now, um, that is uh, Presbyterian and therefore dangerous Unitarian tradition. The Orthodox tradition, the Catholic tradition, the Lutheran tradition was always who is the Ha'on? The one who is? Is Jesus. And hence the importance of that in Byzantine iconography. Now, always in the halo you have Ha'on. Uh, Jesus is? No, it's, if you like, a theological, exegetical point that wherever in the Old Testament you get references to Curios or the Tetragrammaton, we're speaking about Jesus. Very significant for Christian theology. Okay, yeah, now have I answered your question? Well, then I, I would only say that the, the Israelites and the, the Jews, they responded in a typical wrong way. Instead, the proper use of God's name is not be fearful to to not speak it. The pro proper way to use his name, Yahweh, is to trust in him, love him, and let him use him as the way he wants to be used. And he, he will deliver you from your slavery. Okay. You're speaking as a Christian, and not <laughs> as an uh, 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 Israelite. <laughs> See, well, you know, to, to be fair, uh, we always have to understand people in their own terms. Um, yeah, this is so, but that's only so in the light of Christ and in the light of the cross. And because we're justified, what does justification by grace through faith um, uh, remove for us? The fear of screwing up. What? The fear, the fear of, of accidentally screwing up. The accidentally screwing up, and that's positively right. The fear of accidentally stuffing things up, screwing things up. Um, why? Because who carries the can if we stuff up? God. Not God. Jesus. Jesus bears iniquity um, for us. And that means if we desecrate God's holiness, who comes under God's wrath? Christ. They don't have Christ. Therefore they have to, the dominant thing is not uh, 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 the dominant uh, emphasis in Judaism is not trusting in God, but Yalaf. Other than I, the fear of the Lord, which is respect, care. And I can only honour them for that. Uh, the shocking thing is the, the, the way we carelessly use the holy names. Um, it used to be much, we used to be much more strict on that. But uh, these days, you, you can understand non-Christians are taking God's name in vain, but the fact that Christians do that with impunity is a scandal. Yes. Oh, one of my uh, co-workers was an um, Orthodox student. She explained to me that a lot of their energy goes into observing rules, which they understand are not not central. That's right. But they're hedges. 
so that you don't accidentally break yes. one of the commandments. So, that, yes. so they want to correct they want to create a really thick edge yes. so that you're not going to trespass on the commandments themselves. Yes. And since um, God's name is used to promulgate the Ten Commandments, um, if you break any of the Ten Commandments, what ha what you do? You're not just breaking the law, but you are desecrating the holy name. Can I repeat that again? Since the Ten Commandments are promulgated by God under His name, now ten we come. I am who? The Lord, Yahweh, your God. The Ten Commandments then. This governs everything that follows. So if you break one of the Ten Commandments, you don't just transgress against the commandments and defy God's will, but you are desecrating, profaning God's holy name. And so you have the hedges around the law to stop this from happening. Uh, and hence you get the religion of works. Because the works, if you like, are negative works. Try, making sure that you don't accidentally or carelessly uh, infringe, cross any boundary. Now, um, uh, uh, we need to see that quite seriously and not caricature it. So much of what I hear Christians saying about Jews is just unfair and misrepresent, uh, misrepresents them um, with no understanding and we don't take their zeal and their faith seriously. Um, we presume on our salvation, we presume on the grace of God, we presume on Christ and our justification too easily. Now, does that, uh, there's, look, there's some very, very significant things that we're dealing on here that are very, very deep um, and very, very important for us as Christians, but also in relationship to our brothers and sisters who are Jews. And they are our brothers and sisters. Uh, by the way, a lot of this carries over to Islam. Um, you know, why are the Mohammedans so touchy about sacrilege? No, this is the whole fear. To desecrate the holy name of Allah and to desecrate his holy prophet. Uh, you won't understand a lot of the jihad kind of stuff, uh, except in the light of that. Yeah. Uh, so Yahweh is a reference to Jesus. Yes. And for that reason, Christians should never use Yahweh, should never use Jehovah, because Jehovah is an un, the German says, an unding. It's a nonsense thing. It's a no thing. Do you understand that? Jehovah is, you take this, Take the vowels and you get this. So then for the children. Okay, that's from Adonai. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, ho, da. Yep. For the children, Jesus is in the bush. Jesus is in the bush. Yes. And that's classical uh, patristic teaching. It's classical uh, Orthodox teaching. It's classical Lutheran teaching. Uh, you can see, for example, Luther Bibles, and they loved uh, the call of Moses. And it's quite clearly, when you look at the, 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 the woodcut that was and the way decorated, um, uh, you see a person there in the bush. And who do you see? Jesus. And so then Jesus is doing battle with the gods of Egypt. Spot on. Yep. And then is there anything incarnational then about this to Moses? Absolutely, because uh, the Lord doesn't appear to him in terms of a vision. Up and he doesn't go on a heavenly trip. It's quite concrete. How concrete is it? It's that bush. You can touch that bush. You can see that bush. You can see that fire. If Moses got any closer, he could have actually touched that fire. Um... And it's not just that he can see it, but it's an actual place. Since God or Jesus or uh, the Lord is in that place, what does it make that place? Holy, Holy ground. And therefore, Moses has to do what? Do now, why take off his sandals? Is it the same reason you have the unhewn rocks? You know, what God actually created. 
No, it's a different reason here. If that ground is holy, who does it belong to? God. Um, now, you still get that uh, with Indian people. If you go to a Lutheran church, an Indian Lutheran church in Malaysia, or anywhere in the world, in India, do you know what people do when they come to the entrance of the church? Take their shoes off. Take their shoes off. And they go, you never... Uh, uh, go into the sanctuary with shoes. So if you're a pastor officiating an Indian Lutheran church, you have never wear shoes. Why? You're on holy ground. You're on holy ground. In the ancient world, I don't know if you realise it, you, you, you can tell something, uh, the status of people from their dress. The way they dress indicates the status. By the way, it's still the case for us. Dress is very significant in our society. If a person was barefoot, what was the status of that person? Slave. Slave, okay. If you wear wore shoes, you were a free person and a landowner. And you remember the story of Ruth? You know, with the transfer of land involved the transfer of shoes. shoes. So the shoes were the title to the land. Um, landowner. So wearing shoes has to do with ownership of land. You walk over the land you own. Uh, coming to this place, this is God's place, no shoes. You come here not as the owner, but as somebody who comes uh, at God's permission into this holy place. Okay, yes. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. I thinking of something just this morning, I was reading Proverbs 30, and it mentioned here with regard to Profaning God's name. Yes. So otherwise, I might steal and profane the name of my God. Yes. Mm. It's just, it's that, you find it all over the place. Um, it, you know, if you're interested in this, just get your concordance and look up.